Good morning, everybody, and welcome here to Sudbury Baptist Church. Now, in case some of you don't know me, my name is Paul. A few weeks ago, Mark asked me if I would do this for him. And as I've done it once before and survived, I agreed to have another go. Last time I did this, I remember not having a clue about what to talk about. And then all of a sudden having this overwhelming urge from seemingly nowhere to talk about and tell the story of a king called Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Two guys I'd never ever heard of in my life. But I picked up the Bible, studied for the message I was going to deliver and hopefully delivered it okay. Likewise, this time, I've struggled for over two weeks to know what to talk about today. You see, if you're a preacher, it's a bit easier, really, because you can pick a subject, and if you don't finish it on the, the Sunday that you're doing it, you can drag it on to the next Sunday and the next Sunday. But when you're standing in for someone, you have to find a topic that you can literally fit uh, in, in, in the allocated time. Otherwise, um, it would, you, you'd finish your sermon halfway through, still not have finished a story, and it would be like going to the cinema and walking out halfway through a movie. And we're also aware, for those of you that know me, how much I can babble on. I can talk for an hour about nothing. You know, I need to make sure that what I'm talking about today is relevant to being spoken about in a church. So anyway, Mark spoke to me and a week or so went by and I still couldn't seem to find what topic to discuss today. I thought about tackling King David or even the Apostle Paul. But where do you start with those two? So I prayed. I prayed in the morning. I prayed in the evening. I prayed at night. I prayed in my car. I prayed pretty much everywhere and nothing. And then I started to look at YouTube sermons from Billy Graham, from from all kinds of different people trying to find inspiration or anything that I could talk about today here in, in, in church. So last week I really started to panic. I knew there was only a week to go and I still had nothing left to talk about. And you can't just rock up to a church and talk about anything. You need to be well prepared. And then I remembered the words of Canon J. John, who is a pretty well-known evangelist. And he said, when you pray, coincidences happen. And when you don't, they don't. So I carried on praying in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon. And then one morning on my YouTube feed appeared... An interesting story about a lady called Martha. If I'm honest, although I, I'd heard of her sister Mary, I hadn't really heard anything of Martha, and so I was intrigued to find out as much as I possibly could about this woman. So this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a, have a look at the story of one of Jesus's closest friends called Martha and her sister Mary. First of all, though, I'd like us to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of us here in the church and also at home watching this YouTube video. We are all here for a reason and we are all listening to this for a reason. I know we may not know yet what that's all about. We are here today and we welcome you into our hearts, Heavenly Father. Father, I pray that no matter the circumstances, no matter how we are feeling this morning, I pray that we are able to open our ears and hearts to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that as we read about your servants, Martha and Mary, we will take something away with us today that may help us serve you better. Father, we deserve nothing from you, but I ask that your Holy Spirit fills us now, Father. I ask that your presence be felt by each and every one of us, and I ask now that all of us in our homes can just take a moment to invite you, Lord, into our hearts. Father, I ask that this morning you help me to tell this story of your friends, Martha and Mary, accurately. And that as we switch off today from this from this film, 
this this YouTube video, that we may all be filled with the overwhelming sense of your presence within us. Amen. So, this morning, we will be looking at a short story that appears in Luke's Gospel. Chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. I'll give you a second or two to find it in your Bibles. And it's uh, just to repeat, it's Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And while you're looking, I'll just tell you who Martha is. Martha is the sister of Lazarus. You know, the guy who got raised from the dead. And also the sister of Mary. And all three of them were really good friends of Jesus. Not just disciples, but personal friends. Jesus at this time was gaining fame all around the area. He had loads of fans, but these people, these three, they weren't just fans. They were his friends. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let us begin. At the home of Martha and Mary. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, I told you it was a short story. In fact, you don't get much shorter than that. Now, you can see straight away that we are dealing with two very different women. Many people like to compare these two women. Martha is a perfectionist. Martha would make you take your shoes off at the front door before entering the house. Mary is on the sofa watching Netflix in her pyjamas. Martha hoovers the house every day before she goes to work. Mary does it on a Saturday if she can be bothered. Martha is a stress head. Mary is chilled. How many of you at home relate to either of these people? How many of you relate to Mary? And how many relate to Martha? Now, some of you may be wondering what could be so special about this passage that it even deserves to appear in the Bible. Why did Luke even bother to add it? A short description about how a moody Martha was moaning that her sister wouldn't help with the cooking and the dishes. Well, what can we possibly learn from this? Well, this morning we are going to take a thorough, in-depth look at the verses and dissect it apart to see how well we can get to know both of these ladies and then see if we can find the hidden message within. To start with, verse 38 tells us that Jesus and his disciples were on their way. Where from, you may be wondering? Well, we can read earlier in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, the following. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. And do not greet anyone on the road. So Jesus is sending his people ahead of him, preparing the way for him. I guess they would be spreading the word, advertising his visit before he arrived. Very similar like in today's age, how we advertise things before they are about to happen. In those days, there was no TV, there was no radio. So the best way of spreading the word would have been literally to use the word of mouth to spread the word. So here we can get an understanding of what Jesus and his team are up to. They are out on the road. 
And as I said earlier, Jesus was a real big deal at this time. Wherever he went, people would flock to see him in the hope of seeing uh, a miracle being performed. Now back to the passage, continuing with verse 38. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Well, this is the first time that Martha's name is mentioned in the Bible. But we can see straight away that Martha is the homeowner. Now in the days of Christ, women were not treated equal to men. And if the homeowner was a male, it would have been he who opened his house to Jesus. So who is Martha? And why is she in charge here? Now, we cannot know for sure how Martha became the owner of the house. But some early scholars have connected Martha as either the daughter, wife or widow of Simon the leper. What a nickname, eh? Simon the leper. And I used to moan about being called Rodney at school. But anyway, if you're really interested, take a look at the end of this video into Matthew 26 and Mark 14, where there are very similar stories that most probably put Martha as a relation in some way to Simon. And this would certainly explain how Martha became the owner of this house. And we also know for a fact that Martha was a very personal friend of Jesus. As John 11.5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And we can also read in Luke that Jesus said the following. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone promotes peace, who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around. From house to house. So there are very clear instruction not to move around to different houses. As soon as you find one that's good, stay there. Jesus instructed his followers to followers to basically find a good house and stay there. So we can see that it, it makes sense for Jesus to be staying in the house of his good friend Martha. And he was more than likely based there while he was teaching in that area. Now, Martha lived in modern day Israel or the West Bank. And interestingly, the name Martha means mistress, lady boss or landlady. So Martha opens the door and lets Jesus, lets Jesus in. Now, let us pause for a second and place ourselves right there in that doorway. Who's there? Jesus! Mary! Mary! It's Jesus! Jesus is at the door! Not only is the Son of God at the door, but let's also remember that Jesus was travelling with his disciples, all 12 of them. So it's quite likely that he arrived at the house with a group of 12, if not more. Imagine in today's world, Her Majesty the Queen turning up at your house with all of her servants and entourage, how would you react? I'm fairly sure you would be more than slightly stressed. So Martha, the hostess with the mostess, lets them all in and rushes off to the kitchen to prepare the meal. And here we carry on with the scripture, verse 39. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Now, we already know that Martha had a sister called Mary. Now, just so you're not confused, this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Bible has more than one Mary, and this can sometimes lead to confusion. So anyway, let's immerse ourselves again into the home of Martha. Jesus 
has come into the living area with his disciples. And while they are waiting for their food, he sits down and starts to preach to the room. Martha is out in the kitchen preparing a large meal for all of the several guests that have just bombarded her in her house one of which just happens to be the son of God. Now, you can sense the atmosphere. Absolute silence in the room as everybody listens to what Jesus is talking. But in the kitchen, Martha is boiling over, literally smoke coming out of that woman's nose. Where is Mary? I can't believe this. Here I am slaving away and what's she doing? Absolutely nothing. That's what she's doing. And I'll tell you what, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go out there and speak my mind. Now, remember also that in those days, women would normally have gone into another room if a group of men came into the house. Mary is really brave here. She's really breaking social uh, protocol. She had no right to sit there uh, like a disciple. The women should be at the back, not listening at Jesus' feet. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So, Martha, busy preparing a large meal, setting out the table, cooking food, takes a peep into the lounge and sees her sister just sitting there at Jesus' feet. And that's it. She, she just blows up. She can't hold her anger in anymore. Martha walks up to her friend Jesus and in front of everybody says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Now, interestingly, this isn't the first time that Jesus is accused of not caring. Remember the time in the boat when the disciples called out, Lord, don't you care? We are about to drown. Anyway, Martha is pretty angry and she continues by giving Jesus a command. Tell her to help me. Can you imagine being in the room and watching Martha confront the Son of God in this way? I bet you could hear a pin drop as everybody waited to see just how Jesus would react to this interruption. Who does she think she is? They must have all thought. But we are now also able to clearly understand just how friendly Martha and Jesus were for her to have the courage to talk to him in this way. And also just how angry she was with Mary. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. So instead of getting angry at Martha's rudeness or putting her in her place, Jesus simply replies, in a calm voice, Martha, Martha. Now, this may not appear to be too important at a glance, but Martha is the only person in the Bible, as far as I'm aware, it's a bit of a brave statement from me here, but I think I'm right. No doubt somebody will put me in my place. But Martha is the only person in the Bible to have her name repeated by the Lord. Martha, Martha. Again, this is a good friend speaking. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Jesus knows Martha well, and he understands the stress that she is under on this day. He knows how hard she is working away behind the scenes, and he knows the point she is trying to make. But the point he wants to make is even greater. Now, I wonder how I would react if I was having a discussion with people in my house and my wife, my wife walked in and embarrassed me like that. I can't imagine I would be as graceful as Christ. Verse 30, 42. But 
but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Here is the gem in the story. Jesus tells Martha that, in fact, it is Mary who is in the right here. You, Martha, have the Son of God in your house, and you are in the kitchen. Mary puts aside all social etiquette and puts herself right at the feet of the Lord to hear what he has to say. Mary couldn't care less about pots and pans. They'll still be there in the morning. But the Son of God, speaking in my house, deserves my complete attention. Jesus tells Mary, sorry, Jesus tells Martha that Mary has made the right choice and he will not take that away from her. Now, we're not told Martha's reaction to this rebuke, but I can imagine that she would have shut up, sat down and listened to the Lord preach. And this, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, this is our hidden message in the scripture. Martha is so busy with life, she's so concerned with making sure that everyone is okay and that all of her guests are happy in her house. And of course, this is important, but I wonder how many of us can relate to Martha. We spend all day so busy working, cleaning, washing, being a dad, being a mum, being just us that we neglect to listen to Jesus' teaching to us. When was the last time you sat at Jesus' feet? In this age, we are just too busy. Even our free time isn't our free time. As emails pop up from work on our phone, or we see that Aunt Jackie has bought a new poodle on Facebook. Today, we are so busy with living in a way that previous generations could never imagine. Today, there is no privacy. I am lucky that I am old enough and ugly enough and stupid enough that all the things I did as a kid were never recorded on YouTube. But today's youngsters are filmed, recorded, harassed, bullied, victimised online in a way that it's no wonder we have the levels of anxiety that we do today. Martha was anxious, stressed at what was unfolding around her, and Jesus was there in person in her house. Well, friends, I can tell you now with certainty, speaking as a man who has suffered from anxiety, that Jesus is also in your living room. He is wherever you are. He is here in this room. He's there in your room. And all he wants from us is for us to sit at his feet like Mary. Mary prioritised listening to Jesus. And this is the hidden message that we find in this scripture. We need to prioritise our lives around putting him first. So many of us put Jesus last in our lives. And I guarantee that most people, lots of people, will spend half an hour reading Facebook, myself included. But those same people can't find five minutes to read the Bible. It's no good leaving Jesus to the end of the day. He should be the first thing we think of. The first thing we do before we leave the house in the morning is to open the Bible and read something. And if you haven't got time, get up earlier. We're all good at finding excuses. But when you prioritise Jesus, your life will change for the better. Your stress, your anxiety, it will disappear. Life today is so fast, but we can slow it down. Matthew 11:28 says, "Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest." How many of you are weary and burdened? 
Mary knew what was important. And although at first glance she appears to be a lazy person, really Mary has her priorities in order. Interestingly, later on, we can read in the Bible how after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, yet again Martha is hostess at a mill, and I'm sure that on this occasion she too would have sat down and listened to him teach. Friends, I'm here this morning to tell you that Bible study and prayer are vital parts of being a Christian. Listening and talking to God are essential parts of being a child of God. And so I'd just like to finish this morning with a quick prayer. Father, thank you so much for this message spoken this morning. And I pray that all of us may put you first in all we do. I pray that if we feel like we don't know you, that today we can find a quiet room and open our aching hearts to you, Lord, and invite you into our lives. I pray for those of us who have fallen into a routine religion. Lord, I pray that we may be reminded today that it's all about you, Jesus. Father, we sit here now at your feet. Forgive us for neglecting you, Lord, and I ask that you fill us now with your Holy Spirit, that we may just be filled with the joy that is only felt by knowing you. Amen.